So I want everybody just to sit back, relax, and imagine the task that I'm about to describe. So you're sitting in a chair just like you are now, and in front of you is a table. And on that table is two metal posts with a piece of dental floss tied between them tightly, about half an inch long. And your job is to cut that piece of dental floss with a tiny pair of manicuring scissors. Just a show of hands, how many of you think you could do that task? Awesome, you all have confidence in your hand-eye coordination. There's a catch though, and that's you're blindfolded. And you've been blindfolded before you've had a chance to see where this dental floss is on the table. You're also wearing a GoPro camera that's sending a video feed to the room next door which your friend is looking at. And they're gonna tell you through a microphone where you need to put those scissors in order to cut that piece of dental floss. There's one last catch, and that's this GoPro camera's been on one too many adventures, so it only displays in black and white, and the resolution isn't that good. So now, how many of you think you could do that task in the same amount of time? So a little less confidence in your hand-eye coordination. Now imagine that instead of you or I doing this task, it was a robot in outer space being commanded by somebody here on the Earth. Congratulations, you all now know something about on-orbit satellite servicing. So located 22,000 miles above the Earth, in geo-orbit, there's over 400 satellites. And these satellites deliver essential services like cell phone communication, internet communication, maybe search and rescue capabilities, uh, disaster and resource management, weather, or even GPS. And all of these things are things we rely on in our daily lives, maybe even 24 hours a day. So have you ever thought about what happens to those satellites if they break down, if they stop working, maybe running out of fuel, or they have parts on them that break? Usually they just become orbital debris. So they're left up there for a certain number of years until maybe they deorbit back into the Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. Or maybe the satellite provider has left just enough fuel to put them into the ever so ominous graveyard orbit. So the question is, what can we be doing to be repairing and reusing these satellites and extending the life of them? So think about how we get around here on Earth. We can walk somewhere, we can ride a bike, we can drive a car, take a bus, take a train, or even fly in a plane. And in the last four forms of transportation, they all have something in common, and that's that they need fuel. You know how much fuel you need to get from point A to point B, and when you run out of fuel, you simply stop at a gas station and fill your tank. Similarly, a satellite carries a finite amount of fuel on board for chemical propulsion. And when that fuel runs out, it's not like there's any gas stations in outer space to fill the tank up again. If a car, part on your car breaks down, you need a brake change or you need your oil changed, it's easy enough to take your car to a service station or a mechanic to get the part fixed. If a part on a satellite breaks down, there really are limited opportunities for repairs. So some of the technology that would be required to repair and refuel satellites on orbit was invented here. This locally grown initiative looked at how we can be extending the life of exploration and commercial spacecraft. And the way we would do that is by using robotic arms. So this local initiative looked at the test beds here on Earth that would be a proof of concept for what could actually be done in space. When you want to fly hardware in space, you have to pass through nine technology readiness levels. A one being, hey, I have an idea, to nine being, hey, I'm actually flying in space. So this testbed was proving that this idea of sustainable exploration and repairing what we're putting into space could actually be done. So what you see behind me is a six degree of freedom, self-supporting 1G manipulator. And while that sounds insanely complex, all it means is that this robotic arm behaves exactly like a human arm. So the idea is to take something we know a lot about and that we know works well for multiple tasks, like an arm, and applying it to robotics for exploration. So if we just think about how a human arm works, and you can all do this with me, put out your right or left arm, it has seven degrees of freedom. At your shoulder, you can pitch it up and down, that's one. You can yaw it right or left, that's two, or you can roll it, that's three. Just at your elbow, you can pitch up and down, and just below your elbow, you can roll, that's four and five. And then at your wrist, you can pitch up and down, or you can yaw right or left. So this robot, just like a human arm, has a shoulder, an elbow, and a wrist, and it moves exactly the same way. Now, if you or I wanted to perform some sort of dexterous task, like maybe open a jar of peanut butter, or go to the gas station and grab the fuel nozzle to fill your tank, you use your hands. 
These robots don't necessarily have hands, but they have tools that can be used to perform intricate and complicated tasks. So this robot has a refueling tool on the end, which is exactly analogous to the fuel nozzle at a gas station. Or maybe it has a multifunction tool on the end, which does exactly what it sounds like, multiple functions. So that task of picturing the dental floss and you cutting it with scissors wasn't just for fun, it was to get you thinking about what a robot would actually need to do in order to refuel and repair a satellite. So instead of dental floss, there'd be a tiny piece of lock wire. And instead of manicuring scissors, there would be a tiny little cutter tool tip. So if you were to take your car to a gas station, in order to get to the fuel tank, you first need to open the door and then you need to unscrew the cap before you can put the nozzle in. Same idea on a satellite. Instead of a fuel door, you have thermal blankets that you need to pull back, and instead of a fuel valve, you have bolts and a piece of lock wire that you need to cut away. And while these robots wouldn't have a GoPro camera, they'd have dedicated tool cameras, and they'd be displaying in black and white and not the greatest resolution. And the reason that this robotic initiative is so important is because it enables the removal and cleanup of orbital debris. It's about being more aware of what we're launching into outer space and promoting sustainable exploration. We do a really good job here now, and we're starting to do a better job on Earth of taking care of the environment and trying to lessen the human impact. But in outer space, it's really sight unseen. We don't see all the satellites that are up there and all the satellites that are being left to orbital debris. So we need to really start thinking about the technology that we're using for exploration and taking care of it so that we're more socially responsible. So the idea is to be using those robotic arms, sending up a surface or spacecraft like a tow truck and being able to prepare those satellites and extend the life of them. Fortunately, a lot of this technology isn't starting from scratch. We'd be using a legacy of Canadian space robotics, whether it's the Canada arm on the space shuttle, maybe the Canada arm two on the International Space Station that was fundamental in assembling the entire space station, or maybe the Dexter robot, which is the human looking robot with the two arms. And this is important because orbital debris is a serious issue even today. In 2009, an Iridium-class satellite collided with a spent Russian military satellite. And events where satellites come within a couple kilometers of each other happens numerous times a day. The problem with collisions is that it causes a cascade of even smaller debris, which is harder to clean up. So we need to be proactively building and designing space hardware and exploration spacecraft in a way that they can be serviced and maintained. It's about building and creating an affordable and sustainable space infrastructure. So robotic repair and maintenance can really extend the life of exploration and commercial spacecraft. But this whole idea of advancing space robotics, or maybe it's other initiatives like lunar and Mars rovers, is all part of this bigger picture of why we explore. So ever since the beginning of time, humans have been drawn to places that are inhospitable for life, yet are the sources for our wildest dreams. Whether it was Edmund Hillary's summit of Everest in 1953, or Ernest Shackleton's countless expeditions to the Antarctic, or even landing a man on the moon, are perfect examples of this. Because it is the vastness of space and the world around us that makes us want to know more and makes us need to know more. It is the quest for knowledge that is at the forefront of exploration and drives what is possible. I had an opportunity a few weeks ago to travel down to South America, hiking and trekking in Patagonia, and I was able to sail down to Cape Horn. And Cape Horn is notorious for its winds, and when we were there, the winds were 170 kilometers per hour. And if I just stood back for a second and thought about those explorers in the early 16th and 17th centuries that were exploring in winds maybe twice that, sailing the north end of the Drake Passage in absolutely ferocious storms with waves that would just swallow the top deck of their boats, and yet they were driven by this insatiable curiosity to figure out what's out there, to be the first to set foot or sail somewhere and be the first to explore new territory. That's what all of humanity is driven by, this need to know what is out there. So this idea of exploring beyond our planet, this need to push boundaries, it's all gonna require technology for extreme environments. It will be about leading in, engaging in, and thriving in risky business ventures that no one in the world has done yet. Revolutionary firsts, like this project for sustainable satellite servicing, or maybe mining an asteroid, or dare I say, even finally sending humans, whether it's on a one-way mission or not, to Mars. <laughs> Fortunately, a lot of the technology that we develop for exploration actually translates back into applications here on Earth for a lot of good purposes. 
If you take the space robotics I've talked about today, for example, it was adapted for use in the medical and nuclear industries. So out in the Foothill Ho Foothills Hospital in Calgary, there's the NeuroArm robot. And that robot is actually used by doctors to perform brain surgery. And a second iteration of that robotic arm will be able to be used inside the bore of an MRI machine so that the surgeons can perform real-time surgery while getting real-time updates of the images. So it's absolutely incredible to think how even though we're driven to explore and we develop technology specifically for that purpose, it usually translates back into spin-offs here on Earth that really have positive impacts. And whether it's technologies for space exploration or technologies here on Earth, it really just goes to show that innovative companies will dream of the impossible and find the resources to make those dreams possible. And doing the impossible ultimately inspires, which leads to further innovation. One of my favorite books of all time is called Failure is Not an Option. The author, Gene Kranz, tells the stories when he was a flight director at NASA during the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo era of space travel. And while he's telling these stories in this book, he has something that he calls the foundations of mission control. These are simple traits that he expects his team of engineers and scientists to have to ensure that those men got safely to the moon and then safely back from the moon. These were traits like teamwork, confidence, discipline, toughness, responsibility. And I think these traits will be equally as important today as we explore and tomorrow as they were 40 years ago. But the one that we need to do a better job of is teamwork, and teamwork on an international scale, really fostering the international relationships that will make future exploration possible. Because exploration isn't going to be a task tackled by one country alone, it's going to be multinational. And therefore, we must cultivate a global sense of adventure and a global sense of exploration. So this idea of exploring and teamwork and working in an internationally really does tra translate back into the idea of satellite servicing. We need to be working with countries around the world to develop standards for satellites so that maybe in five or ten years' time when we go to refuel a satellite, we don't have to cut a tiny piece of lock wire using cameras in black and white, but maybe we just have to put our fuel tool on an easy interface that's easy to, to adapt to. So aside from teamwork on an international scale, I think teamwork is really important on the level of a community and using a community to help us transform our dreams into a reality and using a community to want to motivate and encourage the next generation to provide mentors and networks and show the next generation that through exploration we can innovate and that we can be catalysts for change and that we can revolutionize the world. It is those who are driven by curiosity who are the fearless leaders with the passion and momentum to transform the way we envision technology and how technology developed for exploration can reshape our lives. It is through innovation and invention that we can truly explore. And exploration allows us to push beyond conceived limitations and expand our capabilities here on Earth and beyond.